Amen. Take your Bible with me this morning, if you would please go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 in the Word of God. John chapter 4, when you get there, you probably uh, recognize this passage of Scripture uh, where we're at, with Jesus and the woman at the well. We'll be talking about that in just a minute. It's not where I'm preaching from, but that's the, the uh, context of this chapter in the beginning. You're there in John chapter 4 now. We'll drop down to verse number 31, and we're going to read about five or six verses. Verse number 31 it says, In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat that ye know not of. Therefore, saith, uh, the, therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him meat, ought to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, There are yet four months, then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he uh, and he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto uh, life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're coming to thy great presence this morning, and we're so thankful that you said our name is written in heaven if we know you, if we've repented of our sin and come to you, that Lord, we, we can be assured that our, our name is there, and that that we'll be with thee one day, either through the rapture or, or just the uh, end of our days. But Lord, what a blessed thought of that. And I pray if there's anyone here this morning, Father, that doesn't know you, you know that, that you'd work on their heart and deal with them. Lord, I pray that you'd, the day would be the day when they would repent of their sin and accept thee as their personal Savior. I pray you would help me to magnify you in the preaching of thy word. May you speak to us. Lord, we need you to deal with us today. To help us, Lord, we, we have areas of our life that need to be more like you, that need to be dealt with, so speak to us in no uncertain terms. May your spirit walk up and down these pews and uh, aisles and, and just touch hearts and, and draw them to thyself. May you be magnified in everything that's said and done today, and especially in my preaching, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice verse number 34 with me, if you would, uh, this morning. It says, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. If you're in the habit of underlining in your Bible, I encourage you to underline that phrase, to finish his work. Uh, and that's the title of my message today. You know, Jesus gave us in this passage of Scripture, uh, especially in this verse, what, what uh, his work and purpose was. And his purpose was to do the will of him that sent him and to finish his work. And by the way, sometimes, you know, we go through life and, and, and uh, even believers may wonder, well, why am I here? Why, why has God placed me on this earth? Well, this is your answer right here. We're here to do uh, his will and to finish his work. That is our job. That is uh, what God has left us here to do. Uh, sometimes we think, well, the Lord's left me here for a purpose. No, He's had you here all the time for a purpose. Every day this is our purpose, to do His will and to finish His work. And that's what I'm going to preach to you about this morning. In John chapter 4, as we begin this chapter, just give you a little quick background of it. We know that Jesus said to His disciples, I must needs go through Samaria. And Samaria was not an, a, a, a town or region area that they would go through because the Samaritans and Jews didn't get along with one another. Uh, the Jews called the Samaritans dogs and, and uh, wouldn't even talk to them. And so when Jesus said, I've got to go through Samaria, they were kind of surprised, I'm sure. And, uh, of course, the reason was he's going to talk to the woman at the well. And so when they get there, he sends them off. They go get food into the town. And, and he begins to deal with this woman about uh, uh, her lit life and the way she was living and deal with her about her need of a Savior. And she, of course, accepts the Lord as Savior accepts him as being the Messiah, and, uh, um, and, and then she goes into town and begins to tell, everyone come see a man that told me all that ever I was. And out of this a great revival, if you will not take time to read the uh, rest of the passage after we quit in verse number 36, but there's a great revival that begins to take place of people 
uh, that some believed on the Lord because of the woman's word and others believed on the Lord because of his preaching. And so the Lord was not there just to reach her, that through her uh, he was able to reach many people and a great revival came to that town. But at the same time as the Lord always does, he, he, he takes something like this and he uses it as a teaching method for the disciples. And, uh, and, and, of course, we can learn from that as well. And I want you to learn several things this morning. We look at four or five as he begins to deal with the disciples in their life to help them see how their life ought to be every day. And, of course, as he deals with them, he's de dealing with us, isn't he? As he talks to them and is recorded in the Word of God, God has it recorded so you can read it, I can preach it, we can, we can look at it together and realize this is what God wants us to do in, in life. And, and uh, the first thing I want you to look at, I'm going to look at five, uh, five different things this morning in this passage of Scripture very quickly. The first one is this, a great unfinished work in verse number 24. A great unfinished work. I want you to think about that where he makes that statement I ask you to underline. To finish his work. To finish his work. The Lord said, I'm come to finish the work that the Father has given me to do. Uh, and of course, that's, that's uh, 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 reaching people with the gospel, okay? Uh, that's the work of God. Uh, what, is, what is God's work? And by the way, the work of God doesn't go on in here. Do you know that? Okay, the work of God goes on out there, okay? The greatest work of God is not the preaching this morning uh, that's going to go on. It's going to hopefully help you and be an encouragement to you. It's not the Sunday school hour, and I hope that was a blessing to you and an encouragement to you. But the greatest work of God, the work of God in our life goes on out there, okay? Uh, what, uh, uh, the work that Grace Baptist Church is going to do is going to be done this week out there on your jobs, in your neighborhoods, with your family and friends. That's where the work of God really takes place. We need to work, move the work of God uh, out of the church and out into the neighborhood. We think sometimes that this is where it all takes place. No, that's where it all takes place. Okay? And, uh, and, and we can be faithful in here and still not be involved in the work of God because the work of God is reaching people with the gospel. If you believe that, say amen this morning. That's it, isn't it? Okay? And that's what the Lord was talking about. That's, I'm to finish that great work, and it is a great work. It's a great work that's been going on for centuries now, for generations, and it has fallen into your hands and my hands. This is our, our job to do the work of the Lord. Jesus said in verse number 34, Jesus said unto him, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. I want you to notice that phrase, my meat. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we're fixing to eat after, after the services today, and, and uh, you know when he's talking about meat, he's not necessarily talking about uh, red meat. He's not necessarily talking about chicken meat or something like that. He's talking about food. In other words, my food is to uh, do the work of him that sent me. Uh, what the necessity of life. That's what he's talking about when he's dealing with my meat. And so he's saying to them, uh, uh, when they're looking and saying, has anybody bought him anything to eat? Has he eaten anything? You know, you look at someone, especially that they haven't eaten in a while, you try to encourage them, you need this, okay? You need to eat to retain your strength, to uh, gain health. Uh, this is the necessity of life, of eating. And, and, he's, and, and they were saying, has anybody given you something to eat? Well, he's saying, listen, the, the, the most important thing about life is not eating, my, what is the necessity of my life is not the meat, it's not the food. My question to you is, what's the necessity of your life? Okay. What is our life all about? Okay. The Lord's saying, my life is not all, about, not all about eating. And listen to me, I love to eat just as much as the next person. Okay. The, uh, the, uh, I, I, I can resist, I, I heard a preacher say this one time, I like this saying, I can resist anything but temptation. Okay. I had to drive around Krispy Kreme three times where I finally gave in the other night. The, uh, the, I love eating as much as anyone, but he's saying that's not what my life is all about. He's saying my life is all about reaching people with the gospel. What is your life about? My meat, he says, is to do the will of him that sent me. Okay. Our life ought to be all about the will of God for our life. The will of God. And I'm not necessarily talking about just the plan of God, what God I want to direct you to do with the rest of your life. I'm talking about what God's will is for us each and every day. And that's reaching people with the gospel. That's our purpose. That's our marching orders. That's what we ought to be doing. And the Lord's saying, that's what my life is all about. 
What is our meat? What is our life all about? You know, it's easy to say, well, my life's all, yes, preacher, my life's all about reaching people with the gospel. It's easy to say that, but if we're not involved in it, it's not that. What, what, what is our time spent at? Okay. Do we spend as much time in reaching people with the gospel as we do in doing anything? Is that what we think about? Uh, is that what our life is about? And he says, and do the will of him that sent me. I like to always connect these two verses. John, uh, Luke 19, 10 says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. And then Jesus said in the Great Commission in, Matthew, in uh, John chapter uh, 20, verse 21, He said, As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. See, Luke tells, that passage in Luke tells us that the reason Jesus came is to seek and to save that which was lost. That was His meat. That was what His life was all about. And then He said in John 20, 21, This is what I've sent you to do. Okay. What are you and I to be doing? It's simple. We're to be reaching people with the gospel. So how many have we reached? Okay. We've, we've, not, we've not missed a meal every day, have we? We've not quit eating somewhere along the way. Because, yes, that's important. But the fact is, is that we ought to be just as busy about reaching people with the gospel. That is the will of God uh, for you and it's for everyone. And to finish His work. You know, we're to finish the work of God, and that work of God is go ye, the gospel says. That we're to go and reach people. I like Matthew. Matthew is the passage of Scripture. We often use about the gospel and, and the marching orders of the church. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. The word go ye actually means as you're going. Now, there's other parts of the gospel that that uh, uh, that's given in in Mark, where it says, "Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature." That is a command. That's what we're to do: to go. The command in Matthew: "Go ye therefore and teach." It's actually teach. That's the command there. That's the action command. The word "go" in that passage of scripture means as you're going. Okay. So in other words, Matthew is talking about as you go to Walmart this week, as you go to your job this week, as you go walk in your neighborhood this week, as you're going throughout your rhythms of life, you ought to be reaching people with the gospel. Okay? You see, if you look at this whole passage of Scripture in John, it was just a natural thing. Jesus, of course, knowing that the woman was going to be there. We don't have that uh, omniscience like he does, but it was just in the natural rhythms of their life. They come, they're going through Samaria, here's a well, they're going to stop there, they're thirsty, they stop there to get water, and uh, the disciples run on into town and pick up some food. It's all in the natural rhythms of life, and while he's sitting there uh, uh, on the well uh, going to have water, a woman comes along and begins to talk to her. Okay. That's, that's what Matthew's talking about. That there's going, to be, there's going to be divine appointments that you have this week that if you're not paying attention, you'll miss them. If it's not your work, if it's not your meat, if it's not you see that as the will of God, you'll miss that. You'll think that's just a circumstance. It just happened to be that way. You just happened to get that person to be your waitress. You just happened to uh, bump into that person on, on, on the third aisle of the grocery store. But no, as far as God's concerned, that was a divine appointment. And it has to be our meat for us to realize that, that that's what we're to be doing each and every day, and we ought to be looking for that. So he's talking about to, uh, to finish this great work, and that's the great work that we ought to be doing. Okay? It's a great work that, that, that ought to consume us each and every, each and every week. You know, the pastor's talking about COVID and, t and telling us a little bit about that. And listen, that's, that's captured the minds and the hearts and the, and, and the attentions of, of, of Americans and the world, hadn't it? Well, I want to tell you what, just as much as that has captured our attention and, and, uh, and, and we've watched that and seen that and learned about that and read about that, it shouldn't be any more than getting the gospel out should have kept, captured our attention. Okay. Right. And we're concerned about it. And we think about it. That, it. that ought to be what our life is all about. And, and everything else ought to be secondary. That's what the Lord is saying. He's going to teach these uh, uh, disciples of His. And if you know the Lord as your personal Savior, okay, if you know Him this morning as your personal Savior, He wants to teach us the same lessons about it. 
It is a great unfinished work. Why is it unfinished? Because you and I still have work to do. The Lord hadn't come back yet. So let's look at the second thing in verse number 35, the first part that he begins to talk about the laborers. There's a labor problem. The first thing was that there's a great unfinished work. The second is this, there's a labor problem in the work. Look at verse 35. He says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. So he starts off that verse saying, Say not ye. Now you could read the passage of Scripture with me again, and we could go over it, and you won't see anywhere in this passage of Scripture where they, where they begin to say, Oh, there's plenty of time. Okay. Oh, we got time to do that. Uh, we got plenty of time to go out here and talk to people, to witness to people, to uh, try to reach people with the gospel, to ask somebody if they know the Lord Jesus, their personal sin. There's plenty of time to do those things. I'll see this person tomorrow. I'll see them next week. I'll pass them. I'll bump into them again. There's plenty of time. Do you see any of them saying that? No, none of them did. But the Lord was not just talking about they were saying it here. They were saying it here in their heart. Okay. In other words, for here's men that he's training, 12. And by the way, if the 12 acted this way, you can count on it. You and I act this way too. Okay. It's common in mine in your life. Uh, that, that we don't say, oh, I'll witness them later. Oh, I'll talk to them later. Oh, uh, there's plenty of time. But we say it in here. We don't say it with our lips, but we say it with our actions. Okay. We say it with our actions. I mean, you never run up on a burning house and there's somebody in there and you say, oh, there's plenty of time. We'll, we'll get them out tomorrow. No, we, we, we sense the urgency of it. But, but when it comes to the things of the Lord, we don't sense that urgency. You see, you may be the, the, the last opportunity somebody has to know the Lord before they go out into eternity. We, we, don't, we don't. That's not our meat sometimes as Christians. That's not what our life is all about, and we don't have that sense of urgency. We are saying, just like the apostles were, were, were saying, they weren't even thinking about it. They, they, they weren't thinking about talking to them. They were saying in their heart, there's plenty of time. We'll get to this. We'll get involved in it one day. You know, the, the fact is that, that as far as the apostles were concerned, they, they were procrastinating. And that's sometimes the biggest sin of you and I as Christians. We procrastinate about the things that we ought to do. We say, one day I'll do it. One day I, I, I witness to somebody on the job. Uh, one day I'll, I'll, I'll come out to soul winning and, 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 and go soul winning with, with the church. One day I, I, I'll talk to my loved one about the Lord. Well, let me ask you a question. Here's a, here's a three by five card. Write it, write it, come write it down on this card. What day you'll do that? Let me know. You see, because the truth is we're just putting it off. We're not really going to do it one day. We're just, that's just what we're saying. I, I'll do it one day, preacher. They'll not come that day. And that's the biggest um, uh, tool in the, in the toolbox of the devil to get us not to do what we ought to be doing for the Lord. See, it is a great work, but sometimes it's not a great work in mind in your life. That it's not great and urgent that we need to be involved in it. He says, he says to them, there's a, a labor problem in the work, and that labor is that, that you men out here that I'm, I'm talking to, I'm teaching, I'm training, you're my disciples, that, that you're saying in your heart, there's plenty of time to do this. And I'm telling you, there's not plenty of time. He said to them, look at verse 35 again, say, say not ye there yet four months and then cometh the harvest. What, what the Lord is really saying to me, to you, don't give excuses. Don't give me an excuse why you can't do this. Don't give me an excuse why, don't say I can't. I, I, can't, I can't do that. Or I won't do that, or, or, or that, that's just not me. No, he's saying, don't give an excuse. That's what he's saying to them. In Matthew, if we believe Matthew, I quoted that to you earlier, Matthew 28, where he says, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. If we really believe that, why in the world would we do it? He has all power. Right. Our God is omnipotent, isn't it? Yeah. 
And, and, and I believe I take that as uh, in two different ways. I think one is saying, hey, listen, Christian, oh, I have all power. There is nothing more powerful than I am. My power is infinite. There's no end to it. You don't have to worry about it. I'm with you, he says in verse number 20. You go, and I'm there with you. I think he meant it that way. But I think also we can, without doing injustice to us, he can do it this way. I am the all-powerful God. There is nobody stronger than I am. I made everything, and I'm commanding you to go. I think he means it that way as too. That is our, our task to do. Now, we ought to go not just because he's all-powerful and we're afraid of him. We ought to go because we love him. He saved us. We're not on our way to hell. If you know him as your personal Savior, we're not on our way to hell because of him. He loved us and he loves other people. We ought to go because he loves them and we ought to love them too. But the problem, even among the disciples, was that they were procrastinating. They were putting off. They were giving excuses of why, uh, why they, they, they couldn't reach other ones. And by the way, did they, when they went into town, did they talk to anyone? The Bible doesn't tell us that. Did they bring anybody back to Jesus saying, Lord, I, brought, I talked to this man and told him you are the Messiah and he wants to come meet you. The Bible didn't tell us that. So as far as we know, they didn't do any of that, did they? And the Lord knew that and they thought there's plenty of time. They were procrastinating in that. He said, don't, don't say, well, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. Or let somebody else do that. You know, I've, 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 I've served my time, let somebody else do that. Or let, you know, that's, that's the deacon's job. That's the Sunday school teacher's job. That's the preacher's job. No, Christian, listen, it's all of our responsibility. Every one of us. Every one of us. How many people have you talked to about the Lord this week? Okay. How many people have you witnessed to? How many tracts have you handed out and laid somewhere? It's, it ought to be that great, will of God for us and we ought to see that that's what God wants us to do with our life. There are people that you can reach that he can't reach. Okay? There are people that you'll come in contact with that no, one else, no other Christian hardly will come in contact with and God wants to use you to reach them. That's the work that God has given us to do. That's that great unfinished task that he wants us to do. So we see that, that there's a, in verse number 34, there's a, a, a great work to be done, an unfinished work to be done. In verse number 35, he begins to talk about that the workers are procrastinating, okay, that they're putting off, there's a, there's a, a problem in the workforce. And then the next thing I want you to see in the latter part of verse number 35 is the command of the Savior concerning the work. I want you to read on with me in verse number 35. He talked about, uh, say not there yet three months and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Now listen to me. I, I, if you had not listened to me before, and I know you have, I want you to listen close to this part, because this is really the key. This is what I need. It's what you need. It's what we all need. Okay. The, uh, he, he began to talk to them uh, concerning the work. And he says, I say unto you, you may feel this way in your heart. You may think I'll do it one day or it's not my job or for whatever reason we may procrastinate and, and, and not do what we ought to do. The Lord says, I say unto you. In other words, he's saying, I'm talking to you. Did you ever, when your kids were young and you were dealing with them and, and, uh, and they didn't seem like they were listening, say, hey, hey, are you listening? I'm talking to you. <laughs> you know, you get their attention. You know, when they're real little, it's you grab their chin, you turn their head right up toward you. Look, daddy's talking to you. Pay attention. Okay, I'm telling you something. You get their attention. Well, that's what the Lord is doing. He's saying, I say unto you, you've said this in your heart, and I know it's in your heart, Christian, but I say unto you. He's saying, I'm, I, I'm, I want your attention. Okay, I'm fixing to say something to you. He's saying, lift up your eyes. What is, he, what is he saying to them? You know, will the apostles walk around like this? Okay, and the Lord said, lift your head up, look up where you're going. Would I just walk around? No, that's not what he's talking about. Okay, is it? We know it's not. He, what he's saying when he says to them, lift up your eyes, he's saying to them, you've got your focus on the wrong thing. You've got your attention on the wrong thing. 
He's actually saying to them, your whole life is about the wrong thing. Okay? What's, what's important, to, uh, uh, should be important to you is not important to you. What should be the focus of your life, Christian, is not the focus of your life. What, what, what should be important to you every day is not what's important to you every day. And that's, that's, that happens to all of us. It's, it, it, it's happened to you this week. It's happened to me this week. Okay. And the Lord's saying to them, lift up your eyes. Get your focus on the right thing. They were looking at the wrong thing. They were thinking about food. Now, there's nothing bad about that, is there? Well, I hope they're not because I sure enjoy eating it. There's nothing bad about food. They were thinking about the Savior. Has anybody brought him to eat? They were worried about their master. Okay. Has anybody brought him to eat? Has somebody brought him something? Has he, has he had food? Has he eaten something? He needs to eat something. There's nothing wrong with those things. And a lot of the things that you and I do every week, there's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing uh, immoral about them. There's nothing evil about them. There's nothing sinful about them. But it's just not the right thing. It's not what our life should be about. You know, we, we, for so many Christians that the, the, the work of God is all about coming to church and being faithful to church. And when we leave here, we feel like we've done for the week. No, no. No, the work just begins when we step out those doors. That, that God doesn't just work on a Monday night visitation or a Thursday night visitation or a Saturday visitation and then work during Sundays uh, when the message is preached and maybe a Wednesday night. The Lord is at work all the time in our life and in other people's life. And so he's saying to, the, to those apostles, you, you need to get your focus on the right thing. You're, you're concerned about things that are not important. And, and for them, it was about the food. It was about whether he ate or not. He's saying to them that, that, that they are to lift their eyes up. The word actually means to, to exalt or to raise up. In other words, he's talking about their vision was wrong. They need to get a greater vision. You understand God can, God can use you to reach around the world. And you say, how can he use me to reach around the world? I'm not talking about surrendering your life to be a missionary. I'm just talking about God can use you to reach people that will reach people that will reach people that will reach around the world. You understand that? You know, I think about, I think about Philip that... Uh, that, that he was preaching, there was a, a great revival taking place in, in Samaria, great revival, and the Lord called him from there to reach this Ethiopian eunuch. He was just like a slave. And so he called him down to reach the Ethiopian eunuch, and, and the Ethiopian eunuch then took the gospel to Ethiopia, to the, to the queen. God can, can use you to reach people that eventually may reach around the world with the gospel. God wants to use us, but we have to lift up our eyes and realize that we have a great work to do that God has given you a great work to do, and it's to finish his work of getting the gospel to this world. Aren't you glad somebody got the gospel to you? Aren't you glad somebody told you about the Savior? And, and that's our task too. He says, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. Perceive it. Perceive it. Now listen, I know this is a missions emphasis. And, and Debbie and I were in missions in the 80s. And many times I'd make this statement when I'd preach at a church. I would say, if, if we're not concerned about our neighbor dying and going to hell, then we cannot say that we're really concerned about the people of the Philippines. If we're not concerned about the people that we work with dying and spending eternity in hell, we can't say that we're really concerned about the people in Canada, regardless if we give. Because it's not right that I'd, I'd give my money, I'd give, uh, 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 you know, 50, 100, 200 dollars a week to missions to get the gospel around the world, want people to be saved in all these countries around the world, and then I wouldn't witness to a soul right here at home that, that there's, that's not scriptural it's not right either is it and do i really have a burden no how can i have a burden for people i've never seen when i don't have a burden for people i see every day 
When was the last time that, that I mean, we went to these altars praying for somebody that's on our job or our loved one, a, a, a brother or sister or mom or dad or a, a cousin, somebody we know was lost, and, and it just seemed like we would, we would die if God did not save them when we'd come down and weep and pray for people who are lost. I want to tell you, in, in 50 years of ministry, that's what I've seen change the most in independent Baptist churches. Yeah. That's all I've ever been in. I didn't come from another uh, uh, belief system. I've always been in a church just like this one. And what I've seen change is that there was a time that, that we had a great burden for people that we worked with, for people that were lost, and, and, and that, was, that, was, that was what our, I mean, we may have been a, a, a plumber during the week, but our, our job during the week was trying to reach people with the gospel okay, to finish that great uh, un unfinished work. He says, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest. In other words, he's talking about the urgency of it. The urgency. We must do it now. We must do it now. You never know, especially in the, the days in which we live right now where, where um, we see people you know, get sick sometimes or have other mobility, uh, 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 other issues with their health, and they get sick and they pass away. We never know where God may place somebody in your path that it's their last opportunity to hear the gospel. It's the command of our Savior concerning our work is what we must do. We must tell others. Let's give, give you the last thing. Here's the last thing we are finished. The reward of the work. Look at verse number 36. In verse number 36 he says, And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gather fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. He says, He that reapeth receiveth wages. There's a, I think it was, maybe Billy, Billy Sonny may have preached the message, Payday Someday. There's a message, payday someday. There's a payday coming in there. There's a payday coming someday that you and I are going to receive because we've, we've, we have been involved in the, this great unfinished work. We have looked on the fields. We have felt the urgency. We have made uh, reaching people with the gospel the focus of our life, the meat of our life. And, and we've been able, the Lord's allowed us to be able to reach some here and there and plant seed and, and, uh, and water seed. And then sometimes so, uh, the Lord allowed us that there'll be a payday one day for that. As I mentioned in Sunday school this morning, O.J. Uh, uh, Smith, Oswald J. Smith said, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. It's sending it on ahead. That there's going to be a payday, and I think one of the greatest paydays that we'll, we will have there is that, uh, that, that we will rejoice, this verse says, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. I believe that we're going to rejoice with those that, that have sowed the seed and we've been out, allowed to reap and others who have, uh, 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 we've sown the seed and they've, they've reaped and then we'll rejoice with those who are in heaven. You know, the Bible talks about for you and I, there's a, a crown of righteousness that we can have and, and that crown of righteousness is sometimes called the soul winner's crown when we've been able to lead somebody to Christ and they're in heaven because God used you to do that. You know, the Bible says, the, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, and bringing his sheaves with him. The fruit of the righteous tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise, the Scripture says. There's a payday someday. The Lord said, there's a work to do. Let's keep our eyes on the, on the main thing, keep the main thing the main thing, and that's reaching people with the gospel. There's a work to do, and there's a payday for it one day. What will you have that day? When you stand before the Lord, what will you have? What will it be? When Debbie and I went to college, uh, I met her at the uh, uh, church. Uh, she wasn't going to college at the time, but I met her at the church. And in the church, they always put on a play. It's called Once to Die. And this play was a, a, a typical Titanic type of play. It, was, uh, it took probably 35, 40 people to put it on, and, and uh, they'd have the platform up there. And, and uh, I saw it every year while I was in college. 
And it was about this uh, plane called the Concorde that was uncrashable and it was on its maiden flight and, and it had all walks of life on there. It was a very interesting play. I even have the, uh, purchased the play right so I could, or the play so I could put it on one day. And, and uh, you know, over there sat the two owners and it had different people and there's a godly Sunday school teacher that was on there and an atheist couple and different ones. There's even people on there that was gonna, that was gonna rob the plane, that was gonna hijack the plane. And so uh, it, it just went from scene to scene, different people's life. The Sunday school teacher, the, the woman who'd been a Sunday school teacher all her life, she gathered all the children around and gave them the gospel. And one little boy got saved. And it was a little boy of the atheist people. And, and he ran back and said, uh, Mom and Daddy, guess what happened to me? To, happened to me? And they said, well, what? And she, he said, I just received Jesus as my Savior. Well, they scorned him. He said, there's no such a thing as a God. Don't believe that. That's just a, a ladder for people who are weak. It's a crutch for people. And uh, they scorned him for getting saved. And, it, and the play went on. There's a young couple that, that she was saved and he was lost and, and she should have never married him because he was lost and yet they had an unequally yoked marriage together and, and, uh, and all of a sudden the plane began to go down. Okay? And as the plane went down and it crashed, the lights went out in the auditorium. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. There was chairs thrown everywhere up here. You hear all kind of commotion going on to depict the plane that crashed and then all of a sudden it was all quiet. And one spotlight shone from the balcony down on the center. People were laying everywhere in disfigured positions like they'd died in the crash. And then it was like the Lord was calling those who were going to heaven, calling them out. And it, and it called the little boy from the, from the atheist couple. And as the little boy walked solemnly off the platform and down the aisle, they began to scream, No, God! No, we believe now! God, please don't take our little boy! It called the... It called the, uh, the young lady away from her husband that she had married. He was lost. She was saved. And, 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 and she walked off the platform and said, No, I believe now, God. I'll accept you now. But it was too late. The one that always got me was the two owners. You thought, the way they talked, both of them were lost. And all of a sudden, it called one of the owners. And he was kind of shocked. He looked shocked. And he began to walk off down the platform. And as he did, the other one looked at him like this and said, You mean you're saved? You mean you're saved and you never told me? He turned to him and said, well, I got saved when I was young. That was me. I got saved when I was young, but I didn't realize it was forever. I didn't realize it was eternal life. And he turned to walk away and he screamed to him and said, you mean you're saved and you never told me and I'm on my way to hell because you never told me. I mean, every time that happened, there was a dart stabbed through my heart. God said, how many people are going to look at you one day and say, I'm on my way to hell because you never told me. They're going to be cast in the lake of fire. Death and hell shall be cast in the lake of fire. Revelation says, how many people are that we're, you and I are going to be there? How many people are going to look and they're going to point a finger at me and say, you didn't tell me, I work with you. It's a great unfinished work. And God says, we need to lift up our eyes. There's people we meet this week that may die and spend eternity in heaven. Have we ever shed a tear over that? Have we ever let God touch our heart? Some of us have loved ones that if they die, brother, sister, mom, or dad, it's spit hell wide open. And we hadn't shed a tear. That's not right. That's not our God. Let's get about the business of his work. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. We're going to have an invitation. In just a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed and eyes closed. And I'm going to pray, and, and if God touches your heart, maybe God laid somebody on your heart that needs to be saved, and you want to pray for them, then come find a place. Let's stand together, heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you know someone, and you want to pray for them this morning. Just come right now, heads bowed and eyes closed. Find a place and pray. Maybe, maybe... You say, Lord, I, I need to lift up my eyes. I go throughout the week, and I pass people, never witness to them. Lord, this last week, I didn't talk to anyone. You need to come tell the Lord you're sorry. Ask the Lord to help you. Be aware of those around you. Come on, as the invitation goes on, if you need to come, find a place here and pray. Join these who are already come. If you need to come, find a place and pray. I'm going to pray for you just a minute in the invitation. I'll turn it over to the pastor after that. But if you need to come, find a place. Maybe you want to see somebody saved. You know somebody. You can come pray and ask the Lord to give you an opportunity.
I open up a door, an effectual door. Lord, give me an opportunity to talk to them and give me boldness. We all need that. We need to pray for boldness and what to say. You and I can't do the work. Only God can. And not to pray for them is the, the, the pinnacle of pride. It's like we say, God, I can do this on my own. Come on, let God have his way. Many of you have come and prayed. You need to come and pray. Come find a place. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning for these who have come, those who have knelt down here this morning, some of them with broken hearts for loved ones and friends and neighbors and, and Lord, others that might have come that, that, that are praying for a broken heart and praying that you would give them the opportunity to, to witness to someone. I pray that you, you would work in their heart and their life. Lord, those who today that, that, uh, that, that maybe are procrastinating or are giving some excuse of why they can't be about your business, I pray that you'd help us to see that this is what you want us to do with life. This is what we're left here for. This is our reason, our purpose. There is no other reason than this. And it's what glorifies you, Father. It's what you gave your son Jesus for. Lord Jesus, it's what you died for. And Lord, may we love them because we love you. And I pray that you'd touch our hearts. Help this message find a, a lodging place somewhere. Help us not leave here today and not think about it, but help us to find a lodging place. May we determine in our heart right now that this week we'll have our eyes on the fields. We'll have our eyes on what you want us to have our eyes on. And we'll be bold witnesses for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor. Heads are still bowed. Eyes are closed. You take your time here at the altar. Maybe there's somebody here today and you say, Brother Justin, nobody's looking around, but... I come in here today and didn't realize it, but I'm on my way to hell. I don't know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I didn't know I needed to receive him. I didn't know what he'd done for me in his death, burial, and resurrection to pay for my sins with his sinless blood. I didn't know that, but, but I know today I'm part of that harvest that someone needed to come to and reap it and tell me about Jesus. And I've heard about him today, and I realize I need Jesus as my Savior today. Would that be you? Would you raise your hand and just say, that's me, Brother Justin. You just raise it and just put it up, put it right back down. I just want to see. I'll be praying for you. I want to help you, but be praying for you. I don't want to call you out. don't want to embarrass you, but I want to help you if possible. Anybody like that today? You're not 100% sure you're on your way to heaven? <coughs> Are you laboring in the unfinished work? I saw a sign when I was living in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, it was on a church sign, a good church. And the sign said something to this effect. If I witness to a person, that means if I tell them about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and what he did for them, if I witness to a person, they make the decision. If I don't witness to a person, I make the decision for them. stuck with me all this time saw the sign one time read it said man that's true if someone doesn't hear the gospel then they can't respond to it Father thank you for your word today thank you for what you told the disciples 2,000 years ago but still relevant today I'm thankful that your word is more relevant than anything that's going on in this world today it's more up to date and it's more accurate than anything else your command's still the same may you help us to be given to you that we might have the urgency and the desire that's in your heart to be in our heart for the lost that'd be something that would consume us would you help us with that today whatever we've spoke to you about today would you would you seal that in our hearts
that we might be obedient to you in this matter because there's a great work that must be done. And the night's coming when we can't work anymore. Or the night's coming when someone won't be able to be worked on anymore. Thank you for softening our hearts today about the issue at hand. And Father, we pray that you bless our time of fellowship here to come. Pray you bless the food that we're going to eat now that we have partaken of your bread and um, and you're working in us. May, you, may that this physical food work in us and strengthen us today. And Lord, please give us a, a, a blessed day and activities ahead. Um, meeting back tonight. Lord, if you tear your coming, we look forward to all these things today. But we look forward to seeing you again and being in your very presence with no flesh to hinder us at, at that time. We ask this in Jesus' name.